Okay. A, an extra one. Cool. That and works. Maybe, we have six and I don't know what it is. Yeah, six. Not, it's six and a bonus. The bonus is, a, oh, I've talked myself into a corner and I don't know what to do. Is the mm -hmm. bonus one. What, did, did anybody watch that first video of him, the, like the first interview he did? I think the most fascinating part about that is the lycanthropy um, zoological study on that because that guy with the, what's his name, Bob Knapp or something? Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Saw, well, I think yeah. they caught him as they were filming him halfway between his transition from human to werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Wolfman Jack or something, right? Yeah, it's like his, his, like his nephew or something. Yep. Like he is to uh, Wolfman Jack what <laughs> Mark is to Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language, and I'm also a trial consultant. Chase? Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I've written a best-selling book on behavioral profiling. I teach behavioral profiling, enhanced influence, intelligence operations, and psychological warfare. I'm also a trial consultant here in the United States. Excellent. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a bunch of books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time in corporate America and on Wall Street. Awesome. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate. Excellent. Well, this today we're going to talk about uh, Bob Lazar. And uh, I'll play a little a little clip ahead of this to show everybody who he is, and uh, just a, a real brief rundown of, of what's going on and why he's of, of interest not only to us but of, uh, apparently a whole bunch of people that have watched our other videos. Of his report, George Knapp introduces us to a local man with an amazing and uh, disturbing story. George, Gary, and Mary Ruth, uh, we've been working on this story for a long time. And we'll tell you right up front that it's going to be hard to swallow at first. Lazar's story is, by any standards, fantastic. He says he's telling it in order to protect himself. He says he was hired to work at an area called S-4. At S-4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. Right, this, this came from somewhere else. I mean, as bizarre as that is to believe, but I mean, it's there. I saw it. I know what the current state of the art is and in, in physics and... It's it can't be done. All right. Well, let's uh, get to the first question or the first uh, video and go from there. But what did you do while you were there? If, you, if you're looking at this object, this reactor, and you can't figure out what it is or how it works, other than the fact that it works on this element that we don't even know about. Sure. I mean, the thing was to but what you do in, you know, with anything, if you're trying to analyze it, all you can do is perform tests. And all we did is try and come up with every kind of test we possibly could. I mean, we tested, you know, it, it, it violated a lot of what we thought was impossible to violate. I mean, one of the, the first laws of thermodynamics, I mean, essentially any machine, any device that operates always makes extra heat. Nothing works at 100% efficient. Even the headphones you're wearing. Any so right out of the gate. Uh, the thing that bothers me here is we're seeing somebody who is, over the years, he's mastered redirection. In other words, you'll ask him a question, he won't give you the answer, he'll give you, he'll, he'll talk about some stuff, and Gre Greg always points this out, and I think he pointed this out to begin with. He brings in information that has nothing to do with the answer, it's, and it's a lot more uh, something you may not know about, be aware of. When he, when he asks him, what did he do there? And the next thing you know, you're talking about thermodynamics. And he's talking about, and he says, and one thing that bothered me is he said one of the first laws of thermodynamics, there are three of them traditionally. And the first one talks about what he's talking about, the, the, the two types of uh, heat, uh, when, you, when, when you get into the details of that. But that just shows that he's, he's redirecting. He does this quite often when he's in a, in a spot like that. We also see what I, I call loping when someone's talking, they're just, they're talking. There's a, a thing on Netflix now called Unsolved Mysteries. In Unsolved Mysteries, there's some, some people who've been uh, picked up by a UFO. They claim that. And there's an old woman on there that's talking. And if she's not telling the truth, it freaks me out because that's the most honest-looking UFO story I've ever heard in my life. And hers, is what, does, yeah, and hers is what she talks. It's loping when you see that, when you hear her talking. So that's what really bothers me with that. We see him do mercy hands, which is a lot of times you'll, you'll see him do this in frame. But when he's down like this, you'll see his thumbs turn. And mercy hands... Or when you say, when you hold your hands up and say, 
have mercy. You got to believe God, please believe me. You've got to have mercy. I mean, believe me. So we're seeing a little bit of that as well. We see it a couple of times throughout these things we'll be looking at. And then, um, what else have I got? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's good. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm already starting to work on eye baselining here. Now, here's the interesting piece. He's told a story so many times. He's doing rote eye movement. So if I tell you a story a million times, I'm going to my base. I can tell you by watching enough of him, he's a right eye recall. So when his eyes are moving to his right, he's doing recall. By the way, about 90% of the population goes the opposite direction for some kind of recall. And all of his is rote. It's all auditory. If you guys remember me telling you, you can't have a cover story because everything is auditory and binary and there are no visual cues, no visual cues here, if you notice. It's all in one, the same place where it's auditory or visual. He gets asked a question, what did you do? Good job, Joe Rogan, by the way. Not many people ask hard yeah. questions. Great he questions. Was great. And, okay, now I'm going to be Greg and talk like Greg for a minute. If you ask me what I do, I'd say physicist shit if I couldn't come up with a better answer. But he didn't come up with a better answer. I would say tested magnetism, tested electricity, tested heat, tested – you could list any one of a number of things that a physicist would talk about. Instead, he goes – and he starts to move into what I call – Mark, I mean, Scott, you had a dead on redirect, but I call it chaff and redirect because mm -hmm. he just starts to puke information until he gets to a common denominator and sees that you understand it. And then when he gets down to that level, then he redirects. And it's an age old thing. Once I get something that's factual that you believe, I can throw out a lead that will cause you to pick up the next question. That starts me down the path of really starting to pay attention to his eyes and those pieces. And I'll loop back to this later in the, in the show because I want you to pay attention to what he's doing to you when he's telling the story. Excellent. Chase, what do you got? So we saw the redirect and he doesn't really answer the question. And a rule for you guys watching, if you ever redirect a story, make it really interesting. Because if it's interesting, it'll be great. And it's a lot a lot easier to get the story across or get the answer out if it's interesting, which his his was. I was riveted by this, learning about this, this alien machine. Uh, one thing you said, Scott, when his hands are like this, you said mercy hands. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in, in that instance, he was trying to say that this is impossible. And I think his hands were open just to express, like, I have no idea what's going on here and maybe just kind of a surrender palm exposure uh, kind of a thing. And one thing we see him do, Joe Rogan asked a question, what did you do? He starts with the pronoun, well, you have to do this, and when you see something like this, you have to investigate it, and he immediately makes a shift to we, 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 we. He, I don't think one time in that segment that we just watched, that he mentions himself. He and never he stammers before he says anything. What did you do? This is the, the pivotal moment in this guy's life, but he can't think of what he did for a good seven seconds. And the, the key, one of the keys here for Joe Rogan was he doesn't say anything. He's got, he's, like we we're always wishing they would just I, shut up. He's not trying to talk every five seconds. He didn't give, he didn't give, so he just waits for that answer and he just keeps puking the whole time. Anyway, sorry about that, Chase. Sorry. Very true. Yeah. And there's so many classes out there that teach deception detection that don't teach you how to ask questions, which really pisses me off because you can be, a, you can be like all of us watching body language. There's not a whole, I'll, I'll be the first one to say it. In this statement we just watched, there's not a whole lot of deception. There's maybe some memorization, which could be a truthful story, but he's, he's made sure that he's got everything straight. Uh, but deception really comes out when we can do things on our side to raise the stakes, increase the anxiety about lying to us. And we're doing other things to question tiny parts of the story where he doesn't know whether or not we know the answer to something or not, like a bait question, which we've, we've talked about in a previous video. So Chase, I would, I'll push back just one little bit here. When you say there's no deception, I think there's deception, but I don't think it's the classic kind where you try to lie your way out of something. I think it's, he's trying to come up with an answer and he doesn't. And then he redirects and redirecting to me is deception. Right. I, I, would, I would say this deception. I didn't say there's no deception. I right. said there's not a whole lot because I typically look for a cluster or a group of yep. several indicators that absolutely I, I would 
absolutely say that that is an indicator of deception, but there's not a whole lot to stack up here. But so there, there is a likelihood that there is some deception here for sure. Excellent. Mark? Yeah. So uh, great job by Joe Rogan there. But Bob Lazar is quite masterful at this. He's pretty well practiced at this. Here's what I see him doing. And it's the kind of stuff I'd train people to do. We do have those open palm gestures, which are used to go, you can believe me. I'm being honest with you because I've, I've got no tools, no weapons, nothing in my hands. I'm a low risk person to be around. So he's already starting this piece around, I'm low risk, um, you can trust me, essentially. Now, here's what he does. He goes big, violating the first law of thermodynamics. If all, all you can do is perform tests on something that violates one of the pivotal laws of universal physics, then all bets are off from now on. Like nothing can now conform to our usual idea about anything. And it means that anything down the road that I might want to poke at and provoke at, my mind is now, it's got, it's got nothing to latch onto anymore. And, and that's either true or false. Either we do have something in the universe that does not comply to the universal laws or it's not true, but if we buy into it's true, it means we can't poke at the story anymore. It, it's, it's a great opening gambit on this, and, it, and it's masterful, I would say. Excellent. I'll tell, I tell you one more thing that bothers me about this, is when he's talking about the, the, three, the, the first law, one of the first laws of thermodynamics, like I said before, there are only three. If he's supposed to be such an awesome physicist, he wouldn't say, one of the first, because there's only three, you're going to say number one, two, or three. Those are the traditional ones. There are, there are a couple more. That's the part That's the part that bugs me a lot there. And then, Chase, I agree with you on your part where you're saying it's impossible. But if you'll watch, you'll see the hands go down. See if I can do it. You see those hands turn right over in there as well. Watch that again if you get a chance or when we flip around and you'll see. How, that's the part I was talking about. And I will say that I have some bias here. I want there to be aliens. Me too. I oh, want man, somebody- me too discover some stuff. I want one of the, some guy who gets elected president, he's going to read through these files and be like, holy crap, I've got to tell everybody. That's one of the first things I would do. Maybe one of the reasons I'm not president. (laughs) That'd be the first thing I'd do. I'd be like, all right, come on, meeting in my office, bring me all the alien crap, bring it all in here. So I, I mean, I watched the movie Interstellar. I cried so many times during this movie I, I, you know, I was really into that stuff, and I want there to be aliens. So me watching this, I've got to admit my bias. I want to believe him. Look, I, I want there to be something else because it means they've cooperated to be this smart to get here. And we seem to not be able to cooperate about what's good for dinner. So it would be a great thing, and I think that's human nature to want that. All of us here probably would love to see something. Now, there are things that I be- Do I believe there are UFOs? Yeah, the Navy has got some great footage of things that we can't explain. That doesn't mean that I have to believe his story to believe that story. That's a piece that we need to keep separate as we go through this. Right. Yeah. But what did you do while you were there? If if you're looking at this object, this reactor, and you can't figure out what it is or how it works, other than the fact that it works on this element that we don't even know about. Sure. I mean, the thing was to, what you do in, you know, with anything, if you're trying to analyze it, all you can do is perform tests. And all we did is try and come up with every kind of test we possibly could. I mean, we tested, you know, it, it, it violated a lot of what we thought was impossible to violate. I mean, one of the, the first laws of thermodynamics, I mean, essentially, any machine, any device that operates always makes extra heat. Nothing works at 100% efficient. Even the headphones you're wearing, anything. All right. Everybody good? Yeah. Let's move on. Now, you said there's nine of them, and you got a brief glimpse at the other ones. Mm-hmm. Were they, how were they different? Oh, they looked completely different. One looked like a, I called a jello mold, and it, it looked like a classic jello mold with the rippled sides to it. One was a very flat disc, um, you know, like a oh, I don't know, like a straw hat or something like that. That was sitting up on its edge, and the thin part of it had, it looked like a projectile had been fired through 
um, the edge of it. So I don't know if they were attempting to, to see if the metal could be penetrated or if something or if that's where the thing came from. Maybe it was shot down. Um, but that was the only one where I saw there was, you know, actual physical damage to it. And that one was roughly the same size? They're all uh, they were kind of too far away to, to tell. Hmm. All right, Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, so I'll just hit a couple of these. Here's him telling a story that he's doing rote. Remember, I told you, and you're going to see in later video, I'm going to see him making up details when he first starts a story and he's up visual cues in the left side of his head and all that. Here it's all rote. It's all to his right, right in the center, right in what I typically refer to as, as the sound processing portion of your face between your brow ridge and your cheekbone, somewhere in there. And he's accessing, he'll rote, he'll come back. He may make eye contact. He knows this story inside out. He's been telling this for 30 years. He's the Susan Lucci of the UFO world. I mean, he's been doing the same role for so long, he's got it down. And so he's giving these details. There's a couple interesting pieces here. When he's asked, is there any damage? Yes, there's one that has a four or five inch hole that's sitting up on its side. There's a little bit of a disconnect here between his facts for me. If I know how big the hole is, and I'm a physicist, I can pretty damn well tell you how big the craft is. If that makes sense to you. I don't care how far away I am from it. I can extrapolate, hey, it's this big and it's 150 to this. But he says it's 52 feet. And then he goes on to talk about how he knows what size these things are. But here he is dancing around the topics. He's ready for that for the questions they're going to answer. And he's just hitting rote. Bump, bump, bump. That's important because I want you to pay attention to he's always, 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 we talk about baseline, he's always recalling to his right. Always. You may ask him a probing question. He may go down to his left as he's having internal conversation. Nothing is ever up here. Nothing. Nothing is ever any place but here or here or straight on. And it's really key here that you pay attention to this rote as we move forward. And I'll leave the rest to you guys because there's a ton in here. But for me, that's the most important piece we locked down right here. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so as I was telling you guys earlier, I've been working with somebody who's been sending me a video of them talking about a virtual experience. And and there's some huge similarities around how they talk about that virtual experience um, and how they talk about real experiences that they've had. And you could look at this person and go, oh, I think they're telling the truth. And they are telling a, a truth of, of sorts. But how I know that it didn't really happen is that there's inconsistencies in the story. The story doesn't make sense for the world as I know it. Now, Lazar is clever because he's invoked the first law of thermodynamics. Doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. So all bets are off. But let me just tell you what is inconsistent with the way I know the universe works. I know that the universe has a level of consistency to it. When I look at human beings, they're roughly two arms, two legs and a head in roughly the same place as me. When I'm spotting aeroplanes, and, and I've seen some craft which are, which are pretty new and pretty exciting, they've got wings. And they got a tail, and there's 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 stuff there. And and Chase, I know you know you were in the navy. If, if and I know there are lots of different ships or boats out there. But my guess would be is everyone that you've seen has had some form of a hull. There is a consistent yeah, raise of the eyebrows there, and he's giving me a, a a little slow blink there to say, yeah, they roughly all have a hull, and even the ones that come out of the water, the hull comes out of the water as the as the aquaplanes lift it out. Here's what is interesting: there's nine different aircraft, and they're all completely different. They're all completely different. I would suggest the universe doesn't work like that. They would have some massive similarities to them, massive similarities. They'd have more similarities than they'd ever have differences because that's the way the universe works. But here's the problem. That theory doesn't work anymore because the first law of thermodynamics wasn't even functioning within this lot. So you can now come back at me and go, well, Mark, just the universe, when we're around these aircraft, these ships, these craft, the fundamental laws of physics do not apply anymore. And that's a brilliant way that means that I can't touch this story. 
I can't nudge this story. I can't find the inconsistency in it because the fundamental laws aren't there. And if I was trying to get somebody to be unable to crack my story, the first thing I'd do is hit a fundamental law and, and keep taking them back to that to say normal rules don't apply on this one. Anyway, that's, that's my end on that one. Wow, that's good. Chase, what do you got? I look for truth signals. So on here, let's start with that. The way that he is using his rote memory, as, as Greg said, and granted, I think Greg, for all four of us, and probably thousands of our listeners, has sold us, and just even us, and we're experts in, in the field. I've been sold more than I ever have been before on the eye movement thing. So we're seeing him go to home on a regular basis. He's just looking that direction. But the use of what I call body narration, where he's narrating the story and he's talking about the craft and the circles in it and, and using his eyes and, and looking at his hands, which is important for body narration. So somebody's describing something and their hands are just doing this and they say, oh, it was massive versus someone looking at it. It's just this massive space and their eyes and hands move together. He has that, which is a, is a pretty solid truth signal. One of the things that we see that might be deceptive here in, in agreement with both of you guys that he's invoked this thing. It is completely different. All these crafts were completely different. In another video, he says they were slightly different. In the video he did back in the 80s, he describes them a little bit differently. And that's kind of all we're seeing here. We're seeing eyes and body move together in unison, which is a good truth signal. But we're also seeing if he was doing some kind of a visual recall of what these things look like, his eyes probably wouldn't move to the exact same direction that he remembers getting a phone call. So guys, just to give you an example, all of you watching, you've watched one more of our videos. Think of the first time you saw us, which direction were each of us in and where were we on the panel? Just think for a minute of that. Think of Prince Andrew. Think of the thing that you remember most about him. And watch your eyes dance around your head. They're going to move to a visual accessing cue. Mark, you just did it. Your eyes moved up. You moved up into your into the visual cortex. Can't go into the back of your head, so they start looking up to try to find space. Guys, this is human behavior. It's why we know when a story is full of it. Excellent. All right. Well, you guys have covered pretty much everything. What I'll do is, and I want to say this about the, when we're giving people tips, and we're saying, here's what's happening here. For example, the other day when, when uh, Chase said, here's, a t here's some tips on whatever it was he was saying. We got a comment where somebody said, why is Chase giving you all tips on this and that? The tips we give aren't for each other. Right. We're giving it, we do this so we can teach people how to do what we're doing so they can see things pop out when we're talking about that we talk about. They'll see those and understand what they are. So we say, here's a tip on this or like what Greg just did, but you prefaced it with, with it's for everybody that's watching or for the person watching. That's what we're doing. So we're, when one of us says, here's a tip it's for you, it's not for us. But, but for we are learning from each other. other. Yeah, I'll, t I'll take all the help yeah. I can get. Same here. We learn from each other <laughs> for sure. I, I learned something. In, in every, what's good about using four people, we all approach this from a different angle. And, you know, it, it keeps us from doing something that is just, oh, yeah, and, oh, yeah, and. I think we will find things that are different. So I, I think that's an important point, though, Scott. This is for yeah. you, not for us. Yeah, exactly. Because here are a couple of tips. <laughs> Let's talk about <laughs> illustrators for a bit. Illustrators are, are the the gestures you make with your hand, with your eyebrows, with your with your body when your brain is trying to emphasize specific words and phrases. Like I just did just say specific words and phrases. If I were to say specific words and phrases and my illustrators don't hit on those words, then there's there's an issue there. Something's not as it should be. So that's what we're seeing here when he's describing the damage that's done on this, on the ship or on the craft, as he calls it. So we see that. And then his illustrators, most of them are right on the money, but those that aren't start dealing around that, the, uh, the damage. And he also, when he says, when he talks about the damage, he pushes it away as he's talking about him too. He starts his illustrators up here and works his way down, but then he starts, it looks like he's pushing them away, like he's pushing away, as some people would say, he's pushing away the, you know, the, the false, the deception. 
whether you believe that or not, I don't know. But so that's what we're seeing, what we're seeing there. And that's what sort of bugs me about that is, is seeing that. Um, and so I'm not, so it, it lets me know if I were to see someone tell me that if I was in an interrogation situation, I would know it wouldn't mean they're lying or telling the truth. I would just know they're unsure about that information. Hey, you That's know, Scott, I work in business as much as anything. And when I'm sitting across the table from someone and I hear them throw a word away, I want to know their commitment. I, I'll probe and say, hey, why don't you throw that away? Or what do you really mean by that? Because you're right. It doesn't have to be an interrogation. We all do this in the real world too. I get, I've had people ask me, well, isn't the real world different from interrogation? No, it's not. Actually, it, it is much more useful in the real world than when I'm sitting across from you and looking scary. If I'm a normal guy talking to you, not that I'm a normal guy, but if I'm a normal guy talking to you, then it's a lot easier for me to use these tools. And Scott, I think you're dead on there. That's the key. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Now you said there's nine of them and you got a brief glimpse at the other ones. Mm-hmm. Were they, how are they different? Oh, they looked completely different. One looked like a, I called a jello mold and it, it looked like a classic jello mold with the, rippled sides to it. One was a very flat disc, um, you know, like a, oh, I don't know, like a straw hat or something like that. That was sitting up on its edge, and the thin part of it had, it looked like a projectile had been fired through um, the edge of it. So I don't know if they were attempting to, to see if the metal could be penetrated or if something, or if that's where the thing came from. Maybe it was shot down. Um but that was the only one where I saw there was, you know, actual physical damage to it. And that one was roughly the same size? They're all... Uh, they were kind of too far away to, to tell. Hmm. All right. Uh, ready? good? Yeah. Let's move on. Did you um, see just one type or different types? There were nine total. Uh, I only got to essentially work, back engineer, or analyze one of the craft. But there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts, and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you where the U.S. Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. No, not at all. That's, uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about it, that they were either shot down or they crashed. Uh, but uh, the craft seem undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct. All right, Chase, what do you got? So we see something here that I think is, I'll give you the truthful part first. Back in this video, he's doing this, I haven't calculated the number of years. A couple of decades prior, 20 years some odd prior to his appearance on Joe Rogan. Same story, different words. That speaks to truth. Same story, same words is more likely to be a rehearsed story. The deceptive part that I see in this interview, if someone looks away, not just with their eyes, but with their skull, so we see eyes and skull looking together, as they're looking away, they're retrieving some data or experiencing some kind of feeling, that's when they'll start talking. In this video, we see a eye and head break away, and then he looks back, to deliver the information. So I think this is the deliberate recall of something that he has memorized that is not truthful. Excellent. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you're starting now to see, number one, yes, Chase, while I agree with you, he is saying the same words, he's using different facts. This is in direct contradiction to what he says to Rogan. There was damage in one of these aircraft. Well, he hasn't been there since before this, so there's a fact issue right here. You can't have you can't have multiple facts in one story. That part I, I have a problem with. Number one, just on the on its face. But watch him. I believe, and I think this is 2009. Wait until we're going to go back to 1989 as well, which is his first time, and you're going to see him building his story. That thing that the Susan Lucci role he's playing now that he's played for 30 years that he knows that role inside out is building. And every time he is probed and poked. He's coming up with more details so that by the time he gets to Joe Rogan, he is much more believable, which is why if you watch Joe Rogan and you thought, hey, this guy's the real deal, I, I, I don't doubt it. When you first look at it with face value without understanding his eyes are moving to the same spot constantly, that he has developed this story over 30 years and he's playing Erica over and over and over, you don't get the 
this piece of it. So when you go in to look at him, pay attention to he's moving around. It's not just his head. He's jitterbugging as he's trying to come up with answers for this guy. And there's almost a little amusement going on in his face as he does it. And as we go further back, you're going to find even more of that as he's filling in these details that will become those permanent words that, that we're talking about, Chase. I think he's a master storyteller. He missed his calling, or maybe he didn't. He is a master storyteller. I wish I believed him because, like you said, I really want to believe this. I want to believe we've got some, some little guys who are telling us how to do the world better sitting in a, a cave somewhere. I just don't think so. Yeah, that's great. Um, the, the thing about the moving around the chair and he's nodding every time he starts talking about the the nine ships and all that, he's giving that confirmation of, yeah, and he's dead eyeing this guy. And he's also wiggling around his chair as he's doing it. So it shows he's a little bit nervous about it, but at the same time trying to make sure he sells it well. You know, that's all I've got. You guys have covered everything. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so one of the things you might want to do if, you, if you're looking for somebody uh, – and, and that they may be nervous around deceit is put them in a chair that moves easily because you will find they'll start swinging on that thing. They'll tip it around. They'll do all kinds of stuff. If you've given them furniture where they can lock themselves in really hard, they'll be looking more calm and assertive. In this one, we don't get the super calm and assertive, you know, um, uh, modern Bob Lazar. We've got a mid-period. Bob Lazar here, uh, you know, the artist known as, and, and he's doing a great job, but we, we've, got, we've got some of those vocal ticks coming in, which again is, is, it gives him time to come up with his story. He's still making a sound. It, it clears the, the throat there because it's getting a bit dry. He's under stress and, and pressure. So, um, and, and look out for that rhythm as well. Think about uh, Scott's idea there of the, of the loping. You know, it's got a rhythm, it's got a, 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 a smooth gallop to it. It suddenly gets very sticky in areas around this. Now, we do see it in, in some of the stuff with, with Joe Rogan. It does hit, he does hit that again. And, and what he does, and again, this is a beautiful technique that you must pay attention to. What he does is he starts to say that he's got a migraine. When he gets off his st story, he starts to say, I've got a migraine. And he's already prepared this because he's told everybody in the studio and his partner there that there's a migraine going on. It's very like Uri Geller used to do. Uri Geller, if it was going wrong for him, would say, I don't feel strong tonight. I don't feel strong. <laughs> and, so, and, and migraines, though we, we do know a lot about why they ex exist and how you get them, it's one of those things you can't touch. You can't go, come on, man, it's just a migraine. Like, come on, pull yourself together. It's just a migraine. The moment somebody says, I've got a migraine, we all, you know, back off and go, okay, okay. We'll all get sure the off then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you're in the village. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah. over it. Greg, don't, don't interrogate me now. I've got a migraine. Can you, you know, take it easy on me? Yeah, of course. Of course, you'd still go for it. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that up in that he's, he's using the mid-period. Uh, he's doing pretty well, certainly a lot better than we, we see in the early period where we will start to see the mouth really moving about all over the place. Um, uh but um, check in with that, some of that Joe Rogan stuff to see where he starts to invoke the idea of I'm not in good physical or mental shape right now. And that's why you might feel so there's some inconsistency in my ideas. That's my take on it. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. And I know that, uh, that Chase and Greg will agree with, with me on this because uh, in interrogation training, when you talk about when someone said Mark hit it right, hit right on, the, on the nail on the head, the dream situation for someone, their sitting situation, is a chair that swivels with wheels on it. I mean, that's, 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 that's uh, that just, that'd be wonderful it was like if we made that the law because that just, you learn so much from that. You know, a lot of times if I'm doing, if I get to do a lot of uh, financial things and so in those rooms they've got those those really nice chairs and you sit there and talk to them. they're wiggling all over the place and that leg gets to go and oh it's it's uh, it's beautiful so it's yeah beautiful. mark yeah you nailed that did you um see just one type or different types there were nine total uh i only got to essentially work back engineer or analyze one of the craft 
but there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts, and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you where the U.S. Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. No, not at all. That's uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about it that they were either shot down or they crashed, uh, but uh, the craft seem undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct. Is everybody good? Yep. Yeah. Let's move on. One of the nine flying discs he says he saw at the base, which was designated S4, looks exactly like this UFO photographed in Europe. Lazar called it the sport model. I, I gave everything simple names. There's a, the top hat one and, you know, I, the jello mold. And uh, the sport model you know, operated, you know, without any hitches at all. I mean, it, it looked new. If I can, if I know what a new flying saucer looks like. Um, one of them looked like it was hit with some sort of projectile. Uh, it had a large hole in the bottom and a large hole in the top with the metal bent out, like uh, some sort of you know large caliber uh, four or five inch projectile had gone through it. So, okay. Well, right here, I know you guys got a ton of stuff about this one, but uh, he didn't. When he talks about the specifics of the hole, we remember on the Joe Rogan one. He talks about how this ship is on its edge and how you can see the. And he doesn't do this number because he says it came from the bottom and went up. Then he would have said from the side this way. So that tells me that's an inconsistency there. Again, I want to believe this cast tell the truth, but this shows me deception in the comparative view of, of the past and the, and the present. Uh, talking about that, and he uses his hands to create uh, to create that picture. And like like. As Chase was saying before, that's so important because he's he's building. I don't know if he's looking at him. I didn't notice that, but he's he's creating that picture in your mind, so you'll have that as he tells the story. That's why he's a good storyteller as well, Greg, because as he tells the story, he builds it and he starts making pictures for you. Again, when we're building uh, pitches for entrepreneurs, one of the things you do is you want to build that a picture they can take out of their head and then go home and pop it in their wife's head or their husband's head because they're going to say. Did you, what did you do? What happened today? You're going to invest in whatever it was. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Why? Cause if you're going to put 300 grand or 1.2 million in that thing, they've, you've got to be able to ex- explain that to your person. Just, you got to be able to nail. It. So they go, oh, that sounds good to me because you're not pitching to the husband or the wife or the other person. You're pitching to that person and you've got to give them something to take home. And that's what he's doing. He's giving us some things to take home and think about later. When you think about that whole, not this, but in the other one, you saw, it should have been that way if that makes sense. All right, Chase, what do you got? I, I, I agree. And I, I will say uh, in disagreement with one thing, that the building the pictures, I would not classify as a strong deceptive behavior. I speak like that naturally. You know, I write, I write fiction. So when I talk about stories, I want you, I want you in it. So if I'm telling you about some cool party, I'm telling you about the, towing the kids on the, on the boat in the tube. I'm going to, I'm going to try to get you in there as much as I can. I'm going to talk about the wake and all the boats out there on the lake on the 4th of July, all that's going to be in there. And the inconsistency that, that you pointed out, Scott, in this video, I imagined a ground artillery unit shooting a five inch shell upward through the craft. In his previous one on Joe Rogan, I imagine them performing this test in the lab from the side. So I think that's a, a very interesting thing to take note of. It's a good data point here. And I will, and I've, I've waited for who knows what reason to challenge Greg on, on the rote, and maybe I'm scared. I've been reading Greg for 10 years before I got to meet this guy. Here we go. Oh, wait just a second. Uh, all right. <laughs> on, Let's on do this. Memorization. Mm-hmm. I think there is a possibility that this guy, as brilliant as he is, I think he may be on the spectrum. Wait. Wait till the next video. <laughs> so, with, him, <laughs> with this possibility, this, this rote memorization could be a result of him from the age of four onward building a mask and how people like to hear stories, how do mom and dad, what makes their eyebrows go up, what makes them squeeze me, all of this, we're developing masks. So he's just remembering techniques to communicate 
instead of being deceptive. And I'm just saying that that's a possibility. I'm not saying that there's an absence of deception. And you know what? So I, I accept the challenge and love that. I, I, I do think that there are anomalies, right? I would not say this is a guy doing this, except you'll see in the next few videos, he's not always been that way. And once you memorize, here's the problem, guys, cover stories, cover stories. I'm going to show you very quickly why a cover story doesn't work. When I remember something, I remember the ninth word of the Star Spangled Banner or the fifth word of Stairway to Heaven, whatever word it is. And you're try to remember that. Watch your eyes. 90% of you are going to go slightly up into your, to your left. 10% are going to go slightly up into your right. That's just the way we're wired. It's not absolute. You have to figure it out in every person. I'm going to ask you another question. Remember your kindergarten teacher. What did he or she look like? Watch your eyes dance up into your head as you recall a visual cue, and it's going to be left or right. That's how we work. That's how we are wired. None of us do this. We don't all go to the same auditory cue over and over and over. But, but, and Mark, you being an acting coach and an actor, you know this. People who act, people, I call it play acting. People who play act don't have emotions. They have words. People who act internalize it and it comes out as part of who they are. And so they feel and their eyes move and they, they sense. And it's how you can tell a good actor from a bad one. The people who just memorize lines, they all go in and in and in and in because they're repeating the lines. Watch a bad actor on stage. Go to a high school play and look for the good actors and the bad actors. The bad ones are going to be standing there regurgitating Shakespeare, da 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 with no feeling. The guys who get it, they're they're feeling what they're saying because they're internalizing it. And so watch this guy because what you're going to see is in his younger years. When you ask him a question he doesn't know the answer to, he's going to have to go and make it up, and his eyes are going to deviate dramatically from what he's doing on Joe Rogan. Watch. And I think, yes, there can be deviations, and, and I agree with you, Chase, 100%. A person can have an anomaly of a body language, and you have to look for it. That's why we looked for it, and we got it. You'll see it. Excellent. And Chase, I agree with you on the, on the part about when you're there, you're building those things. He knows that. That's why he's creating that picture for you to take home. Yep. It, I, I'm, I'm, a vi I'm not a visual guy. Look, tiny little eyes, big ears. I'm an auditory guy. I love stories that have, to you, both your points, that have details because I don't care about looking at things. I care about one to know what happened and, and how it went and that kind of thing. So both you're right. I mean, it's about building that picture. And I agree with you. He knows that he's building a picture for you to take home, Scott. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Mark, do you want to gang up on uh, Chase with us? No, not at all. Let me respond to that real quick. But if, if someone is memorizing a mask or building a mask, they'll still go to a memorized line or a memorized pattern of behavior, which could make their eyes move in the same direction. Sure. Yeah. But all, all this memorization going the same place all the time is why cover stories don't work. Because when I ask you what you did last Tuesday and you go to auditory memory. Yeah. Then we see a deviation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mark, which I, what do you got? You may be about to see. Yeah. So I would say one of the biggest differences for me, this is, early artist Bob Lazar compared to the artists that we have right now, go and watch him now and there is a smoothness to it. There's a calm assertiveness to it, rather like you get from a, a quality performer, okay? In this early, early version, it's super staccato. And think about when Chase was telling us about the wake of the boat and how smooth that was. And, and yeah, Chase, I think your, your accent is originally maybe Texan, I'm not quite sure. But, but it, and Texan does have, you know, a smoothness to it. But even so, Chase was elongating the words because he wanted to make sure that we, we really felt it as well. Bob in this last video is super staccato. He's just trying to get through it. Now, what he does do in both of these um, is, is what we call nested loops, where he starts a story, doesn't finish it, starts another, doesn't finish it, and then drops into something where he finishes that. And that, what that causes us to do is to grab hold of anything that he, that he gives us. Uh, uh, the US has a, has a president at the moment which uses those same nested loops as well. So we kind of go, what was that about? What was that? Oh, that bit, that bit I get. And it gives a great deal of satisfaction and it means we'll, we'll grab hold of elements of story that normally we'd go, you know what, well, that's not, that doesn't seem accurate to me. So we've got to know that throughout this, this, this work that Bob Lazar has been doing, he's been skilled 
to an extent, right from the start. It's just when he gets in front of Joe Rogan, arguably biggest show on earth right now, <laughs> like yes. stakes are high, uh, and Joe Rogan needs to keep that high because Joe Rogan now has one of the best rating shows. So of course you've got to get Bob Lazar on. Of course, it's like, it's, it's an act. It's the act. You've got to get, have Bob Lazar on the, on the show. And, and at that point, Bob's a serious player now, a serious player. And that's why when I look through the majority of, of how he's talking, I think like, like Chase and I think like everybody else, I see some, incredible elements of truth to it i'll be his champion uh here for just a second when he did say realm he did uh preface that with this is a very poor way to describe this <laughs> and, and guys if you'll watch him uh, I'll, I'll, this is my only little snippet about him not about mine and your your back and forth chase a couple of things he is moving around he is accessing his eyes are going up left that you don't see at any point in the Joe Rogan story. Now, either one of two things is true. If he's recalling and his eyes are going here, then he is not recalling when he is going here. So one or the other of those is deceptive and clearly deceptive. And you don't have to believe an eye movement. You just have to believe that baseline matters. You don't have to believe that what I do works, but you do have to believe that if a person always does this and they suddenly stop, that means something. We all believe that. And you're going to find, I'll give you a great thing to do on the Rogan show. Turn it on fast forward and turn the sound off and watch him touch his face. I got a list of where he touches his face. They're all contentious issues. That means something. Does it always mean something? No. But if he only does it when it's contentious, it means something. You know, if, <clears throat> if he watches this and then we see him again, we're going to be, wow, this cat I'm in. <laughs> there are UFOs. There are Welcome UFOs. to the show. We'd love to have you. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, we'd love to see you and, and prove us wrong. Yeah. One of the nine flying disks he says he saw at the base, which was designated S-4, looks exactly like this UFO photographed in Europe. Lazar called it the sport model. I, I gave everything simple names. There's a, the top hat one and, you know, I, the jello mold. And uh, the sport model you know, operated, you know, without any hitches at all. I mean, it, it looked new. If I can, if I know what a new flying Zauser looks like, um, one of them looked like it was hit with some sort of projectile. Uh, it had a large hole in the bottom and a large hole in the top with the metal bent out, like uh, some sort of you know large caliber uh, four or five inch projectile had gone through it. All right, everybody, good. Yeah, let's move on. So you were seeing what it could do, but you couldn't ever figure out how it was doing it. No, not really. I mean, we really, we really could only use a or come up with a best guess. And um, now I can't say we really I, I, that I could absolutely state for certainly or certainty how anything actually worked. All right, Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, this one is a little different. He's asking him a question, a direct question. Did anybody hear an answer? No. I, to me, this is a red flag kind of an answer, and and there are quite a few of these in Rogan's response. In his response to Rogan, he stammers and he's looking for space. He stares at him, he moves his eyes around, but he really doesn't have anything to add back. This is a follow on, I think, to "Hey, what did you do every day?" But in this one, I don't see him answering anything. I see him deferring the question, dancing around, pushing away. And to your point, Mark, I think this is one of the places where he said. I have a migraine and he backs away from it. Mm -hmm. He puts up his force field because he's just okay. lost the ability to answer. But again, look, if I'm thinking about how much work I put into something, I would expect to see an emotional or some other kind of a, I put a lot of work into it and we didn't discover anything. There's a lot of inconsistencies in this whole story. Uh, among my favorites, and you can take this out or leave it in, is how did you turn the thing on? You put this little dome over this little tower for the reactor and it came on. And then you couldn't touch it. Well, how the hell do you turn it off if that's the case? If you can't take the dome back off, how do you turn it off? So there's a whole lot of weirdness in this story that a good interrogator go, hold on, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but if that's how you turn it on, how do you turn it off? And you don't have to put that in. But there's a lot of that that goes on in this story because, to your point, Mark, well, of course, it's a spaceship. It's a different thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I agree with you on the flag. That's that's that there's he's trying to find his usual spot. He's been placed in his spot 
to answer a question, but there's no place to redirect. He can't get a hold of it yet, I don't think. Um, I can tell that Chase is going to come in and go, Here? no. <laughs> what do you got, Chase? I actually agree uh, on on the counts here. So, and, and you guys have all seen my behavioral table of elements. It's my stab at, at creating – maybe the first system, the only system, I was just trying to codify deception and human behavior, just, just my attempt at it. And in, in, on that behavioral table, we say we've got to have a score of an 11 for deception to be about pretty much very likely. And right here we have an eight. <laughs> so we see two behaviors that are a score a four, which is the highest score that one behavior can get. So the first one, we see a non-answer. If you ask someone a question and they don't answer directly, that is a non-answer statement. So it's not an answer. And second, we see something called a postural retreat, where at the end here, I think just after this video, he kind of leans back and he's a little bit resigned. And it's, it's almost a kind of a defensive gesture. We see Nixon do this when he says, I'm not a crook. And he steps back from the podium, crosses his arms. So we see this postural retreat that happens after the deceptive statement, which is when it's most likely to happen. So we see two of those, which give him a score of an 8 out of an 11. So we have most likely deception for this. Excellent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, one, so one quest, can I ask one question of Chase first? Do you have element 115 on your chart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you need to, you need to add... A new, a new gesture to, for, for, element, element one for that element. Yeah. But that element only lasts for, for, for microseconds in the, in, the, in the real universe. Uh, but in Bob Lazar universe, we got boxes you, get, of you can get a big lump the of it. It's yeah. The unobtainable. It's the unobtainable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can get a big lump of it. By the way, I do want to say, if, if, for everybody watching, uh, get Chase's table of elements it's really really but be superb. careful with that you got to be careful because my front lobe got pummeled after when i first got that i was like you gotta be kidding me how long did that take man how long yeah. did that take Jeez. Yeah. years nine years Days. Oh, guys i don't yeah. i think what before we let mark finish up this one I, this is a great opportunity each of us has a very different approach to get to the same thing and what we want you to hear is the reason we like working with each other. I'm the sharp stick in a sandy beach guy. I want to quick get my answer right now. When I profile people, I'm like, why is that different? I'm not, I don't do something as methodical as, as Chase does. Every one of us brings a little different twist to this, which is why I think we're a great team. And I really applaud that. Thanks, oh, Thanks. Appreciate it. Lovely. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. So let me so, tell you what I say. Uh, element 115 is. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go. <laughs> Watch it. Don't raid your house. <laughs> <laughs> let, me t let me tell you what I see here. Um, is he's asked, how does it work? And here's what happens. Is that Joe Rogan sets him up for the here's how it works routine. And Lazar packs the hell out. Basically, he's going... I don't do that routine anymore. I don't do the how it work acts anymore. And the reason I think he doesn't do that is we now know too much about Higgs bosons and particle accelerators and your general lay person has a pretty good idea because what he's, what he'd say in earlier stuff is you have to remember anti -gra uh, gravity. It, 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 um, it warps time and space. Okay. So, so people didn't know that at that time. So when he says you have to remember, he's basically telling you all bets are off because this is gravity and gravity will warp everything. So we don't buy that anymore because we know a little bit better as lay people how this science works. I don't think you'd get Bob Lazar anymore to tell you how it works. And he would have told you 20 years ago, exactly how it works. And that is a red flag for me. Yeah. And in that flag, you'll see him panicking because I think that's what we're seeing as well. When he starts that, when he starts getting back, he starts closing down his illustrators from the get go on that. His illustrators are small. He hardly moves. You see some movement, but you can't tell exactly what it is. And, he, and his illustrators are somewhere on, but they're very small compared to what he usually does when he answers. So. can't finish that. the sentence. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you were seeing what it could do, but you couldn't ever figure out how it was doing it. No, not really. I mean, we really, we really could only use a or come up with a best guess. And um, now I can't say we really <laughs> that I could absolutely state for certainly or certainty how anything actually worked. All right, everybody, good. Did they contain any information about the um, history of mankind, the alien involvement in the history of mankind? Not, not really. No, nothing that said, well, this is the way things were. Uh, there, there, there was mention of um, um, alien intervention uh, in in the past. I mean, it, it, extremely long ago. Uh, something along the lines of uh, I have millions of years ago. Uh, for the information that that I looked at, it, it seemed that. Uh, and there again, these are briefing documents, so I can't, I, I can't myself ascertain whether or not these are true. I can only assume it because the briefing documents I read that pertain to the propulsion system were true because I, I dealt with that. But uh, they did make reference to uh, uh, contact with the Earth over 10,000 years ago, uh, also with uh, uh, genetic alterations that ended in uh, uh, a simian being and uh, all kinds of uh, claims. All right. Yeah, right out of the gate there, he starts, when, when he asks him that question, he starts off with no, basically. There's not much at all. Then he starts getting into the history of, of humankind, starts talking about things that happened millions of years ago that were in this, the documents or whatever he's talking about in there. Then he goes on to talk about how there it goes uh, talks about ten thousand years and becoming simian, uh, simian beings and it's like you got to be kidding me. This show, and I, he's creating that on the fly. I think we're seeing him make that up as he goes because who would have asked him that before? How would he have thought that up? So I'm, I think we're seeing him create something as he goes. So Greg, as to your uh, eye accessing, wherever he's looking there, he's looking down to his yeah. right. I think not his right. He's creating right there, man. Well, yeah, but emotional content, right? It, it, that's a I'm on the ropes move. That's not he's creating in, intellectually. He's on the ropes, right? When when I get you and start punching you in the gut, you go to emotion. Your his brain is kind of jumping around like a squirrel in the road a little bit. He starts off with not really, but tongue out. And this is not a grooming move. This is a uh oh. And then he goes to internal conversation, scrambling back and forth. Anytime you're looking at somebody and they're down and they're back and forth. They are, they are scrambling back and forth with internal conversation. Watch his respiration increase. It's dramatic. He's all, Chase, you always say it, he's breathing heavily in his upper chest and his respiration increases. He starts to distance and push himself further and further away from whatever he's going to say by saying, this was in something somebody else had written, and so I can't attest to how true it is, but I can attest to how true what I read on my side was, well, how why would you have reason to doubt that? Number one, he's pushing himself up. He even puts his force field up as he holds his hands up and says figuratively, I can't be held responsible for that. This is prime. This is early in the game, early enough. He's not gotten to rote memory and he's still defending himself. Scott, I hope we have, I think we have one in here of even earlier, like 1989 when he's really young and he's moving his eyes around and all that. But he is scrambling. That, that's squirrel in the road right there when you see him go down right. He's having an internal conversation and feeling it, and you can see the respiration increase and the dodging and ducking and then the force field. Hmm. All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is the early artist at work very much, and, and, and by the time we get to Rogan, he's masterful and he's had all these questions. This is the artist sketching it out. He's like, he hasn't had this question before. And the, and the, the interviewer has kind of gone, D do you have a song about flowers? And he's gone, no, I don't do flowers. And then he's gone, yeah, actually... I'll, I'll just I'll, Why not? I'll, I'll do one for you right now um all right how does it begin so so it's exactly what so non-verbally what we get at the start is lots of vocal tics we've got lots of shrugs we've got this this side one side of the mouth stretching out here in the really early version he'll go from side to side to side to side he's super nervous early on but he's you know he's he's, he's written a few of these songs already and some have gone down really well he just hasn't done this one so here's what so there's inconsistency for a start millions of years tens of thousands of years the document kind of said both 
okay? Then he, then he excuses the document by going, some of the document may have been just false information for security reasons. So there's a get out of that, like pay no attention to that line. That line's a bit rubbish and there's a good reason why there. And then I think here's what happens. He gets into the rhythm of it and he gets into the rhythm of it because he starts to do very basic universal mythology or what you'd, you'd hear um, Eric von Danken do. I think he was writing in the 60s previous. He starts to mm. regurgitate, I think, some of the von Danken stories, essentially, and the idea of the, the mating of the ethereal thing with the human thing in order to get something superior and yet human. It's the gods uh, mating with, it's, it's, it's fire from the gods. It's Prometheus. History Channel. Yeah, exactly. It's it's Prometheus, and and of course that's a that's a beautiful, interesting story, and and it hits us on a very fundamental level, and so we kind of tune into that and go, well, we'll forgive you that this is clearly the first time you've ever written this song, but it's a good song. I like this. However badly you sing the song, the premise of the song is a beautiful song. The gods. The gods made love to us, and they and we had children. It's it's a great it's a great song. So so um, you know, good good goodish early work, but easily to see, easy to see. He, he had never written this one before. And again, I don't think you get him singing that song now. I think if you go to the the Rogan show, I I'm not you know I, I don't think he 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 starts he does that number. He's not doing that album anymore. Yeah. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, he's taking that off his set list. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Mark, we call those humalians. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you learn anything from <laughs> that's the term for that? <laughs> I took, sorry, uh, I've, I've, good. I've forgotten. Yes. Wow. I agree with you all of you guys. I think there is some deception don't here. You, Mark, don't you watch our videos, man? Every Thursday. Not, not nearly Every enough. Thursday. Not nearly it's enough. Okay. Okay, every Thursday. Okay, Chase, sorry, man. I do think there's some deception here. And I agree with everything you guys said. I'm not going to just piggyback onto it. But if you saw the history of mankind, you're not going to be kicked back in a chair. I wish I was wearing glasses like he was, like you guys are, because I'd be like, oh, holy crap. Let me tell you what I saw in these papers. It's going to blow your mind. That would be my reaction. I, that I would be so excited to tell you this is why we're here. Experimentation, this DNA modification that goes back millions, oh wait, thousands of years to create who we are today. And then it was a nervous, contrived conversation. Well, he didn't have an answer is really what it boils down to. I think to your yeah. point, nothing in his set list and he just has to reach around and pull it out. And when he does, what he finds is not, not easy to describe. So he's rambling and making up stuff and just pulling words together. You know, we talked about AI being able to tell deception. None of these words would find their way into an AI pattern. It's just stuff he's scrambling. Okay. Does anybody see this little hair up here? Looks like I've got an antenna. I do now. I can't, I can't, I can't not look at it now. You shouldn't have said that. I know. It's like I've got a direct line to that woman we talked like about. You're, you're attached to a particle accelerator right now. <laughs> Van de Graaff. Yeah. 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 That's probably talking to me. That's an energy weapon. <laughs> yeah. Did they contain any information about the um, history of mankind, the alien involvement in the history of mankind? Not, not really. Not, nothing that said, well, this is the way things were. Uh, there, there, there was mention of... Um, Alien intervention in in the past. I mean, extremely long ago. Uh, something along the lines of uh, I have millions of years ago. Uh, for the information that that I looked at, it it seemed that. Uh, and there again, these are briefing documents, so I can't I, I can't myself ascertain whether or not these are true. I can only assume it because the briefing documents I read that pertain to the propulsion system were true because I, I dealt with that. But uh, they did make reference to uh, 
uh, contact with the Earth over 10,000 years ago, uh, also with uh, uh, genetic alterations that ended in uh, uh, a simian being and uh, all kinds of uh, claims. You should Everybody good? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's move on. There he is. It's difficult to, uh, to really surmise how long it had been operational. Everything did look fairly new. Uh, by that I mean I don't think this installation was there in the early 70s. Uh, nothing was worn. Uh, things look fairly freshly painted. So, uh, you know, as a ballpark guess, I would say it would, it would really surprise me if the installation was older than five, seven, ten years, something like that. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is where we see super early days for him. Sides of the mouth, one side goes up, the other side goes up, the other side goes up, the other side goes up. He's all over the place. Here's what I'd say that you should do watching this, is think about just listening to what he's talking about there. Just listen to it. At the end of listening to it, think, does that feel, does that seem credible? Is there some doubt in my instinct around this? Then go back and watch it and notice what simply showing an aerial photograph of maybe Area 51, I, I don't even know whether there were at that point any aerial photographs available, but something, just showing something that seems to be solid, if we want to believe in this idea, and even if we don't, it lends such credibility when we show that aerial photograph, even just take that aerial photograph out and watch him again and think, do I, does this feel credible? Does it seem credible to me? I understand media knows that we all love to watch these stories and we love it when they feel really credible. I mean, look, we're doing an episode ourselves because we know we love doing it. You love watching it. It's a brilliant, brilliant story. But just take out some of those, um, I guess, very firm ideas of credibility, and it just starts to fall to bits. And I think that's what happens here, early days for him. And there is nothing that he's saying that really finishes or has any tonality or any body language of credibility around it, from my point of view. I don't know whether you guys see anything else. That's, I, I agree with you completely because if you were to just, when you just listen to it, all you hear is the stop and start and stop and start. And it's really true. And whether he's making that part up there on the spot, I don't know, but it, it just, that's just automatically sends bells and whistles off in my world for that. I, I can't, I can't get past that. Chase, what do you got? What I think he's doing here is waiting for a nod from the interviewer that he's, that his statement's complete. So this stop and start, I think, is the, the interviewers are staring at it. So he keeps looking back to the interviewer and saying, oh, crap, I'm not done yet. Uh, the walls were freshly painted, and uh, it, it looked like a pretty new building. Looks back to the interviewer, and I would, I would probably guess the building was this many years old. So I think that he's not getting much back from the interviewer, so he's continuing to go, which is a fantastic tactic. For you, Scott, as an interrogator, I'm giving you guys advice and no one else. Uh, if you're in an interrogation and you just maintain that silence, you would be shocked at how yeah. much stuff keeps keeps coming out. Yeah. But what happens when you do that silence is you'll see a stop, start, stop, start of information. And, and you got to be brave to do the silence thing. It's, it's one thing to read about it on a, on a LinkedIn job interview article. It's a whole other deal to do it in real life. And it's 30 seconds is an eternity. Yes. Mm. Oh. Yeah, you're not kidding because that's when they start adding what he did. What you're explaining is he's adding those qualifiers to it. Yeah. That's, 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 we talked about that in our last video, I think. How when you just pause and wait, you ask the question, just sit there yep. and keep looking at them, they'll start adding things to it. That's when we talked about breaking eye contact and all those types of things. Greg, what do you got? That's, but that's advanced interrogation. Now, guys, here's where I'm going to show you that Bob Lazar is not telling you the truth. This is going to be really easy for you to make a decision about, forget us, you're going to go back after you watch this and watch Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, on that show, Joe Rogan asks good, hard questions and forces this guy to answer them. 
And when he answers them, he does that rote memory thing almost every time. When he gets in a bind, his eyes dodge away to his left. Now, go back, watch what we just watched. It's bigger than simply request for approval. And he does plenty of that where he raises his forehead and stares right at, I'm staring at Chase on my screen to try to get approval, but it's bigger than that. When he is saying it, the reason he's stuttering through it is he goes to his visual construct. Watch him. His eyes go up hard and to his left as he's making up the details about freshly painted. And then he shops his answer, something we've talked about in past videos. It's three, four, it's five, it's seven years. But he's up left accessing, creating what it looked like so he can describe it, pulls back down, looks dead at you. Now, that could be his baseline for truth. If it is, then this isn't that he's doing on Rogan all the time. What in fact I'm seeing here is you hit it dead on. This is the infant version, Mark. This is the infant version of Lazar and he's creating the story and people are helping him. He's shopping the story, they're, they're poking holes in it and he's filling in the holes. This is how cover stories work and that kind of things you fill them in. Then he's got it down to rope and he just dun, 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 and he backs away, he chaffs and redirects all the things we we're talking about earlier. Go back and watch him now using that, and you'll see a very different thing than you saw watching him without all that knowledge. I'm going to bring up one point, too. I agree with you 100%. But I'm going to bring up one point about that uh, thing Mark was talking about where his mouth keeps going. He does that from day one. Yep. He does he does it on both sides in the, in the from at day one, I guess we'll call it a 1989 interview. But if you see him, he does it on every interview that he's in. So I, I think, and I'm bringing that up because I think most people will think that, the, un, the, un, the people who aren't, as deep into the stuff as we are, they're going to think that's duping delight or duper's delight. And I don't think that's what we're seeing there. Just we see it a couple of times. Yeah. But that's part of the, That's part of what he's doing. It's either as, uh, you know, as, or as a, little, a, a tick or whatever, but he keeps, he does that quite often. So I, I, so I want to point that out because it just kept bugging the squat out of me, but because I know people say, Oh, it's duper's delight, but I don't believe that's what it is. Chase. So I, I agree that I've seen body language experts, on, on YouTube, say that this is Duper's delight. It's, there's contempt, facial expression. It's just a it's a baseline zone. It's quirky. Yeah, yeah, it's just a quirky dude. I would yeah. I would just add to that. What's great about when you see with him with Rogan is he's softened a lot of that. He's so much more calm and assertive. And that's that's why he gives such a good performance in the Rogan show. He locks himself down. He's in it. He locks his chair down, pretty much locks his face down to a certain extent. And it's only when he gets asked to do routines that he doesn't want to do anymore because they would be easier to take, take apart that he seems to have an issue with it. It, it, there's an interesting thing as you watch him through here. He, they go to this science that's accepted science, and, you know, he'll, they'll use things like, well, gravity waves. He first talked about them, and they weren't proven. Well, Einstein talked about gravity waves, and he's been dead longer than we've been alive. So let's not pretend that because something's been proven that he talked about that he invented it. But that's one of their go-tos to redirect and pull you back into it. And they even, they even get Rogan on at one time where they talk about gravity waves not being discovered until 2016. And he was talking about it in 89, but that's a misdirect. Yeah. And well, you'll, you'll see in the Rogan show, what happens later on is they talk about a, um, a device that can measure the bones in your hand to, to tell that it's, it's. I used to work for that not. company. <laughs> right. So, so, so here's the thing. Uh, what happens with that is because they produce a real one and because then Bob is able to go, there, you see, I told you, now everything's true. But that's not how logic works. That's like me saying, you know, I rode for Cambridge in the Oxford and Cambridge and you go but there's no details about that and then suddenly and you can't get any history of, history of me uh, ever in a rowing club but then suddenly somebody comes along with an oar with my name on it and I go you see an oar with my name on therefore everything is correct no it just means there's an oar with your name on so because and it's a it's a it's a brilliant way and I, and I think that is kind of purposely revealed in the Rogan show later on 
in order that it makes everything that we've heard before uh, accurate and correct. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm a big fan, after watching this, I'm a big fan of, of, of Bob Lazar um, because, <laughs> because I think he's brilliant what he, what he does in the same way that Uri Geller is, is, is brilliant and was brilliant in his, in his time. I mean, there's, just, there's a very specific lie there, which he's telling you stuff that isn't true. But sometimes the story, the beauty of the story is more important than whether it's a lie or not, I would, I would say. The idea that it might be possible, you know, I, just like you guys, I would love to live in a world where alien life is possible. And so somebody tells me a decent story yeah. about it. I'm open to the story. I'm open to living in the idea of it. Now, is it true? Well, from Bob's <laughs> from looking at Bob, his story isn't true. That's not, that's not true. Might, might it be generally true that aliens exist? I, I actually just don't know. I'd love it if they did. And I'm open to some information or, or, or um, evidence of it. I just don't think he has it. So let me go back just really quick, just to finish up what I was saying, that when we see the evolution of behavior from his younger videos – to nowadays, we see an evolution of showmanship. But I think another thing we could potentially be seeing is the evolution of a mask that was created by somebody that might be on the spectrum. Because we could see that in an adult who's on the spectrum when they're 50, which is Silicon Valley is, is full of those kinds of people, and they get more and more socially intelligent and very sharpened to understand exactly what people need to see and hear as, as they age, which I'm only presenting as a possibility. No, no, yeah, I, here I will say this. That, that's entirely a possibility. I don't think as much engagement as he had socially in the beginning. I think what brought him to the game is that ability to socially engage. Because if you watch his earlier stuff, the guy's engaging. He is very engaging. Oh, yeah. There's a smirk to him all the time, but he's engaging. And you don't typically think of people on the spectrum as being that engaged. You also don't think of a lot of that, right? And he's got a lot of that. His face is a circus early in the thing. Yeah, like, I think his, I think his eyebrow, we were seeing too much eyebrow movement for that as well. Yeah. But I, I think it's possible, yes, but I don't think he is that guy. Right. Definitely a possibility. But if you are watching this video, one of the things that one of the interviewers could have done as us interrogators – sometimes do it's called the incomplete leading questions or incomplete questions and we say so then you walked in the building and rogan does that rogan lead. does some of that yeah I, I heard a couple of those we didn't have any here in in our clips that we reviewed but those are fantastic they're not necessarily leading questions because you're not putting information there so you're saying you guys left and then everybody bridge I and mean, you just kind of dot 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 you leave that gap there for the other person to fill in and that is a very powerful questioning technique that you can use today if you like well all right well that's everything so why don't we uh throw it around the room run around one time and we'll give everyone's perspective on what you think the uh percentage of truth is versus uh deception greg you want to go first yeah, so I'm not even going to pretend that I believe there's truth in this story. I'm not going to pretend that he worked in an alien aircraft factory. I'm not going to pretend any of that. What I'm going to tell you is fantastic job of storytelling. Really masterful. He knows his routine. You watch him. If you hadn't seen the earlier stuff where you're seeing him access and think and create on the fly, you wouldn't know that he is just repeating something he's rehearsed over and over. That's why I called him Susan Lucci. He's been doing the same role for 35 years. He should be good at it, and he should get better, and he's maturing, and he is stabilizing, and so he doesn't move around as much as you do when you're young. It's part of what we see. When I interrogate a general, I wouldn't expect the same thing I got from a private, right? Very different mindset very different level of calm. It doesn't make me believe him anymore. It makes me believe him less that he always goes to the same place. I'm going to leave you with this. Eye movement is contentious. The four of us have differing opinions of it at times. I'm going to tell you that you can't have it both ways. You can't have a baseline that says, I always go here, except when I'm asked a hard question, then I go there. Uh, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, I, I love Bob Lazar. I, I, I especially like him on the Joe Rogan show because he does such a masterful job on that, apart from a few areas. Uh, so, yeah, great entertainer, uh, great interviewee. Has he ever seen an alien spacecraft? No. No, he just hasn't. It's not happened. Chase, what do you got? I think he believes some of this. And I think there may be some truth to the fact that he did work in a building or had a security clearance or something like this, which helps him to catapult the rest of his own belief in, in the rest of the story. I think we're at a, a 50-50 truth and deception here. And it's just from the videos we watch, it, it's not 100% to say which is deceptive and which is truthful. But I think that he does believe a lot of what he's saying. That's why we're not seeing a lot of stress and emotion there when he's responding to interviewers. All right. Well, I think we're seeing, uh, I think we're seeing a combination of, of truth and deception. I'm with Greg. I'm not going to pretend I believe that this cat saw a bunch of spaceships at all. And the, the, I like to, you know, we, a lot of the comments we get are, did you not do your research at all? Look at this cat. Remember we talked about when we first, well, before we started recording, we talked about his, his past and things that have been going on. When a person has a past that's chock full of deception in the ways his was, you know, I, I, I believe um, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing somebody who knows how to tell a story because their background shows they've been telling those stories for a long time. Not just since he was a kid, but as an adult as well. After he'd already come out with this is when he got in some, some trouble as well. And I don't think he's. I don't think he saw any spaceships. I don't think he saw the maps he's talking about. I don't think he saw any of that. I think he's just creating the story, and that's what we're seeing. Great guy, awesome storyteller. I'm done with you on that one, but I don't. I don't think we're seeing. Um, I don't. Th I don't think this happened the way he says it happened, or that it happened to him like that. Love us or hate us, that's what we saw. Yeah, we we'll, we call him like we see him. If we see deception, we'll say we see deception here, here, and here. If we see truth, we say we see truth here, here, and here. We're not on anybody's side. Like Chase said, I want there to be UFOs so bad. I want to see little green men. I want to, or gray men. I want to see all that. I want it to be truth. I want that to happen. We're not detectives, as Greg says. We're just relaying how things look to us, and that's it. All right. All right. Thanks, Sam. Yep. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a fun one, actually. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, then uh, I'll see you guys on the next one. Good. Here's the question I, I wanted to bring up in the video. Why are aliens always, always naked when they're being described? What if that is the space suit? What if this is yeah, the, that's the like goggles an and that's the suit? Well, yeah, because we're thinking about 1960s technology with a big... But when I see stuff like that, that makes me think maybe that's their, their uniform, in other words.